Welcome to Feature Please, a hateful voyage from the Delta Quadrant. My name is Joseph. And I'm your co-host, Peter. So, my apologies to everyone. I guess it will be a few weeks ago by the time you're listening to this, but I, I, I got an episode out late. And I got it out late because I had to spend approximately 80 billion years in the car. <laughs> uh, I have a family that lives... Uh, quite a distance away from me. Both my sisters live out of state. I'm in Ohio and uh, one lives in Florida and one lives in New Orleans. And uh, I visited both of them this year to be the good sibling that I am. And myself and my wife, Stevie, we uh, we decided to road trip both of them. Like lunatics. Yeah. Like hardcore, hardcore Americans. We are the, the Florida trip. We split up the drive down, which was perfect. We did the drive back in one day, and that was hell on earth. Uh, we For New Orleans, because I just didn't want to take too much time off of work, we drove down and up each in one day. And uh, I found my limit. My limit is is genuinely eight hours in the car. That's it. After that, I start to go crazy. Like, I go stir crazy. Like, nothing can distract me at that point. Like, eight hours, you can break that up. You get some good conversation. You get some good sights. You throw on some podcasts, which I, I actually did do. And then that eight hours, is like a work day and you're done. That's fine. But once you get to, like, 10 and then 12 and then 15, which is what it fucking took me to get home. No. On Monday. No. I just my my skin starts to crawl. Your ass just hurts. There's nothing you can do. It's the worst. Have you uh have you been on any long road trips this year that you've had to like take podcasts on or anything like that? No, I'm an adult now. I fly. <laughs> uh, the most podcast material I need is maybe two to three hours. The longest road trip I think uh, the worst trip was uh, down to Jacksonville, Florida, on a Greyhound, and that was with Whoa, the on a bus. Ugh. On a bus with diarrhea and oh, oh. stop and go traffic. That was hell. And uh, on the way back up, I was visiting my grandfather. He gave me a bag full of handmade, like homemade, authentic Italian meatball subs with a lot of garlic. And that thing was just chilling out on the floor. And I'll tell you, after about like the fifth or sixth hour of that thing sitting at room temperature on a bus, it got like terribly stinky, but I was in such a bad mood that I refused to throw it out because <laughs> if I was going to be miserable on this goddamn bus, I was going to stink it up. I'm a very petty person and like schadenfreude oh, is my middle name. So I know uh, I really, really took deep spiritual delight at stinking that bus up with rotting meat. I remember but stories was... not go I, I, your, your pettiness. Let's. Let's talk about that for a second, because I, I think it's we a only legendary. have an hour for this podcast, Joe. This <laughs> might have to be mess hall material. Uh, you know, folks, I've, I've had the distinct honor and privilege of knowing Peter now for about a decade. Mm. And some of the greatest works of art in petty revenge have been authored by him. Uh, now, this has been assisted in no small part by our, our former shared hobby, providing so many opportunities yeah for for that petty revenge but let's just say i'm going to help (laughs) but anyway point is you're very petty but you're also very good at it so i'm glad you could stink that bus up yeah me too that uh that's what helped keep my sanity but anyways i think this is supposed to be a story about you taking podcasts on the road yeah so use this opportunity to try and catch up on some stuff but for whatever reason i was in a mood to listen to our own show just to kind of like see Sometimes you go back and you like listen to a random episode and you can be like, feel for, oh, that worked well. Oh, that didn't, you know, next time I record, I'll keep that in mind, that sort of thing. Sure. And I don't know, I've I've done this as a hobby long enough that doesn't like bother me to listen to my own voice. I know that's like a real turnoff for some people. For our old podcast, it used to bother me a lot with the new mic that I use now. Um, I really... You know, because I'm a narcissist, I, I love going back, listen to our old stuff. And what's funny <laughs> is when I listen to like our old stuff for quality control, I'm like, oh, man, I hope I mention X. Oh, good. I did. Oh, great. <laughs> like, I'm like, ah, I hope the conversation goes in this direction because it's been so long. And then when it does, I'm I'm very excited and happy and, and self-absorbed and lame. Well, 
speaking of your ego, we have a number of our fans that have also listened to our show apparently on long trips, on drives. They take the opportunity to get caught up then. You know what? Thank you, fans. I, I don't care if you're listening to this a year after it gets published because you're on a road trip to Sheboygan or something like that. We appreciate however it is that you listen to us. And, and you have our heartfelt apologies good. that you've had to go to Sheboygan. Ooh, nothing. No teeth there. That's for sure. <laughs> Not any good ones anyway. And, you know, I, I also want to give a, uh, a brief appreciation to our friends at Hail and Well Met. Uh, I, they've asked us to be part of something. I'm not going to talk about what it is yet. Cause I don't know if that's, that's okay. Uh, but let's just say that uh, they, they wanted some assistance with something and I can't wait to provide it. It's very cryptic, Joe. I, I think that all, uh, there's several different ways to take that and they're all fun. Speaking uh, of fun, <laughs> what did we watch this week? Well, sloppy one. Uh, season four, episode 12, <laughs> Mortal Coil. I recall telling you that I think that you were going to like this and that it was objectively good last week. Yeah. Was I right? Um, I couldn't possibly give a shit about this episode if it wasn't for the fact that it was four seasons and 11 episodes in. Um, this This was a magic episode for several reasons. And I think if you were to take the standard Voyager formula, which has always been a very episodic ship in a bubble, uh, someone needs to be able to walk in off the street, watch this and then walk away and feel like they, you know, were able to come in. You you know, that's why Voyager does this right. Syndication. Like you're always Mm -hmm. trying to appease a first time watcher with every episode, not just syndication network television. Remember, this was a network TV show. It was an anchor for an entire network. They wanted it as accessible as possible. Right. No, uh, no pre-requirements. Just come in, watch, and and want to come back for more. And it's not like they're super self-referential or that there's a ton of callbacks in this episode. But I think if this was anyone watching other than someone who was put in four seasons, that this would have been probably a confusing mess or super boring but because I've come to start to really appreciate and love these characters, I found it to be excellent. That I, all those caveats make sense. Um, I think I would have appreciated it is just for the kind of story it told. Cause I like that kind of story as we have established. However, I agree with your overall thought that it is all the more meaningful because it invests itself in the story of the characters it shows to focus on and uses your years long knowledge of them to pay off things that we know have happened to them in a way that is almost uh, unheard of for an episode of Voyager. I also think that the, I guess the final confrontation in this episode may be one of the more uniquely adult things ever done on an episode of Star Trek. Yeah. And you know, let me, let me jump into the, the end sequence or the middle sequence here. The stealth MVP in all of this ends up being Chakotay. And we've talked before about like when things work, when things don't work. When is Tuvok a good character? And normally when we're focused on Tuvok, Tuvok becomes an awful character. And Chakotay's backstory and his Native American pseudo nonsense that they got from a, a crooked consultant has always been a real black eye for the show. But this time I felt like when they prayed all that stuff out and he becomes a spiritual advisor to Neelix in a time of need and they jump into the medicine bag and a coochie moy and all that other stuff that we've harped on mercilessly. It's like, okay, this is pre-established stuff we know is going on. It's not the primary focus of the episode. They're bringing out pre-established genre that we've created for the show. And yeah, it the, the 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 round peg is going in the round hole just perfectly at this moment. I also think that this episode had so many opportunities to take a cop out and took none of them and rode the hard line all the way to the end. Yeah. And it, this is not a show that ever does that this is the sh- a show whose best episode to date has been defined by how much it did not actually matter to the show itself 
right? That was our beef with the year of hell was this didn't matter. This was excellent, but ultimately meant nothing. Whereas this had all the opportunities and all of the off ramps to be able to be like, and this goes away. Bye bye. And it didn't take a single one of them. And it goes uncomfortably to its end. You know, Neil character growth episodes always seem to take a tragic turn somehow and and change him permanently for the better like neelix doesn't get a lot of character development but when he does they really seem to get the best mileage out of it and i think the interesting thing another interesting thing about this episode that's very uncharacteristic for uh, voyagers there's no bad guy and it's very rare in voyager especially to have a situation where there's no external threat or conflict that endangers the entire ship and it's just one person coming to deal with terms on a very low key risk to the rest of the crew. I think to round out our kind of pre episode discussion, uh, it's worth saying that this, you know, it, we are a comedy podcast. We like to take a lighthearted look at things. This is not a funny episode is very serious and it deals with a very serious real life topic. So let's just say it now. If you're looking for this episode for yucks, you're probably not going to find many. It's still, I think a really good discussion that we're going to have. So if you're into that, stick around. Yeah. This is Um, an episode about, I thought this was an episode about racism. That whole thing. Isn't this a whole episode about how the Kazon weren't good enough to get assimilated? Oh, Jesus. (laughs) You did watch Mortal Coil, right? <laughs> you fucking got me good, dude. That was good. I'm like, wait a second. What? Yeah. Racism? <laughs> the fuck? <laughs> I don't know what you're watching. That's that's what that was my takeaway was that the, the Kmart Klingons are such galactic trash that not even the Borg wanted to bring them into their cult. I, I got to agree. That was like the Borg have standards and the Kmart Klingons do not meet them. Like, woof yeah. you gotta do a lot to disappoint them nope they they uh they assimilate ferengi so do they yeah well i guess in the books they did I and mean, you've never seen an, an on-screen one but yeah the books yeah you're right i mean those hardly count but you know like oof, yeah anyway so it's a suicide episode it's a god's not real episode it's uh it's one yeah. of those that that might touch in some places you're not uh comfortable with but if there's one thing everybody does love, it's that coffee. <laughs> oh, yeah. So we open with Neelix doing his his best impression of uh, running his Waffle House and uh, pouring some apparently very strong coffee for one Ensign Kim and, you know, glad handing everybody and uh, Seven of Nine complaining that uh, he's enhanced her dining experiences with a bunch of unwanted Talaxian spices, which we know from the past can be some pretty nasty shit. She calls it pungent. And that seems like a very appropriate word to anything Talaxian related. There's a lot of uh, big food no-nos in this. When she's talking about pungent, all I could think in my head was that nasty close up of his feet with the fused toes. I don't know why that was the part that stuck in my head. There's also some gratuitous... That's going to stick in your head forever. That's what I'm going to see when I die. That's what I'm going to see when I go to the Great Force. It's just Neelix's feet as he's dancing around. Uh, here's another thing I really like about this episode, is on top of the the ultimate moral dilemma that he encounters, this is a really good slice of life for Voyager, which I feel we don't get enough of. And stuff like fair trade, and other things where it's just Voyager's crew interacting with itself outside of a uh, hazard pay crisis or some other, ex- you know, huge threat. Like, I like seeing them do family stuff. I like seeing daily operations. I like seeing what civilians get up to and all that other stuff. So uh, this whole, I would say the first two thirds of the the show um, all come off really good. Chakotay comes down, however, to the mess hall to specifically invite Neelix out on an away team mission to go into a nebula so they can uh, collect some space MacGuffins out of the clouds. 
And uh, Neelix is quick to reply that this is something that he's dealt with heavily before in his life as a trader, that these space MacGuffins are some of the best power sources in the Delta Quadrant and that he would love to lend his expertise. So Proto Matter has a pedigree in Star Trek. I don't know if you know this. I remember it best as a uh, the MacGuffin of the uh, Genesis device. So if you think back to Star Trek 2 and 3, I don't think it necessarily gets mentioned until Star Trek 3. But the Genesis device was created using proto matter and that ends up being the rationale for why the genesis planet starts to like break apart because it's inherently unstable Mm. so the the idea of proto matter has a star trek lineage however not and it's also i think mentioned in other situations when they want to like have a explosive thing um i don't remember exactly where but i know it's come up since then but none of that comes up here. They're like, oh, proto matter. Oh, yes, I'm an expert. It's unstable, but powerful. And then that's it. A little disappointing. They specifically went and used something as as having a pedigree like proto matter and then didn't actually bring it up. They do bring up two other things in this initial mess hall scene, one of which is that uh, Trixon is coming up, which is the Talaxian uh, celebration of family, which sounds pretty cool. And again, fun what does the crew do when it's not using force fields to hold the ship together from blowing up? Uh, and we also find out that Edson Wildman is still alive, as is her child, even though we haven't heard about them in what feels like a season and a half. And somehow Neelix ended up being uh, Ensign Wildman's daughter's godfather. I don't know how much of a lonely outcast you have to be on the crew for Neelix to be the person you turn to to be the godfather figure, but um my heart goes out to you naomi as far as like emotionally available you know people to like be a babysitter you have to admit that neelix isn't a terrible choice i mean he's certainly a better choice than uh ensign vorik i'll give her that yeah like ensign vorik may try and stealth rape somebody and you never you never want kids around about that that was okay the ugly side of vulcan I, I don't think that's a contemptible choice. Like he's a, a pretty he's he's oriented towards wanting to do it. Mm-hmm. So that probably counts for a lot. But uh, we do see uh, Ensign Wildman and uh, her 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 child, Naomi, who has to be what, uh, 10. So I don't know how, what age the actress was. So they have an original child actress for this episode who's terrible i didn't think she was that bad they improve with their next selection when the next time they she shows up she's recast to somebody else and then that actress is used for the rest of her appearances on the show um but it's a a child that is clearly not like two (laughs) which is what age uh you know naomi would be and that is chalked up to her physiology. So as they established at the time of her birth, uh, Naomi's father, uh, Samantha Wildman's husband, uh, is of a species that matures quickly. Uh, convenient, of course, because that way they can turn the baby into a character on the show very quickly by saying space stuff you know hey waving their hands work. space we've, magic we've made far crazier leaps of logic so you know what works works for me bring it on and so naomi's old enough to be you know believing in monsters under the bed yeah i'm afraid of monsters but I, you know i speak in complete sentences so i'd i'd peg her at like the six to seven range sure seems seems likely here you know Neelix is good at being like, you know, substitute dad, you know, doing the put the kid to bed, make sure there's no monsters anywhere, that sort of thing. And and by the way, Samantha Wildman has maximum mom hair. I don't know why they put this had her hair done that way or if that's a wig, but her head is like 80 percent hair. Yeah. And it's 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 straight 1982 mom hair. It's nuts. Speaking of but, nuts, uh, I think that it's a good time to point out that uh, Ensign Wildman is extremely possessive and somewhat crazy stalkerish. 
by the time we get to the last scene, uh, she has Neelix on speed dial. And she's the kind of person that when they call you on the comm system, isn't afraid to say, hey, why aren't you responding? Pick up, pick up. Wildman's got a screw loose. Trust me. Well, listen, there's a reason why she stays in Ensign for the whole run of the show. <laughs> Like some people don't. There's a reason why she turned to Neelix for a Godfather. Role. <laughs> she cray. She cray. She cray. Okay, she cray. Uh, Neelix dispels all the monsters from the bed and uh, puts Naomi to sleep. In the process, he tells her a story about uh, what keeps him feeling safe when he's scared, and it is the Great Force, which is a pretty charming tale, basically talking about heaven. Uh, it's Talaxian heaven where. All of your dead loved ones are waiting for you and they welcome you in and they are watching over you constantly. And that's what keeps him warm and safe. And Naomi seems to buy it. Uh, and off Neelix goes down to the cargo bay to look for a certain cylinder that has screen credit, I believe, that reaches back to fair trade. Uh, I don't know if you picked up on it, but I think that's the old like warp plasma canister. Yeah. So it's uh, look, looked like that was from there. It was it was a possession of his that. It makes sense if it's the same thing, right? Because it's what he did the the contain the warp plasma when he was going to go ahead and suicide himself. To I'd say it wouldn't make sense because I'm pretty sure that fucking thing blew up before it, you know, melted some people's faces off. But uh, a similar one, sure. Uh, while he's down in the cargo bay looking around, he encounters Seven of Nine, and I, you know, sometimes Neelix is just so goddamn annoying, and even him like standing around talking to himself, like. I just didn't feel annoyed. It's 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 a great Neelix episode all over. And even the stuff that should be driving me crazy, I still found to be somewhat endearing. Maybe it's just because maybe it's because, you know, seven goes so far in the other direction. They balance each other out. I think they did that just to provide a contrast of, you know, Neelix is this very personable, warm, people oriented person. Seven of nine is the opposite and that contrast gives you insight into how seven relates to everyone. Right. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that, that comes to play out in the episode and ends up being particularly potently used, I think by stealth MVP Jacote at the end. Yeah. While, uh, Neelix is picking up this plasma container. He mentions that he has not had to use this thing since, uh, back in his trading days and he mentions the Kazon and my eyes kind of my ears perk up when I hear this because we haven't heard jack shit about the Kazon. I mean, it's hard enough to find anything about Kess, let alone the Kazon, who I don't think have been mentioned at all since basics part two. Uh, and when he says this, that's when seven of nine chimes in and she's like, oh, yeah, species, uh, whatever. And he's like, oh, my gosh, you know about the Kazon. And she's like, yeah, there's space trash. <laughs> flying around on their El Camino hoopties. Yeah, as we mentioned, uh, this, I believe, is the only time we ever hear of a of of the Borg saying, yes, we encountered them and they're so terrible we didn't assimilate them. Like, we are the Borg. We, uh, you know what? Pass. Yeah, hard pass. Like, you know what? Don't look at them in the eyes. <laughs> Just move away, trans warp away slowly. <laughs> It's like, don't give that begging man any money. He stinks of patchouli. <laughs> I just love the, the visual of the Borg when they finally encounter a species so inferior. They don't want to they don't actually want to assimilate it, like awkwardly avoiding eye contact, not like destroying them or assimilating them, what you'd expect, but just like just just being really uncomfortable. And then they're like, but we want to be assimilated. We want to be better. And they're like, no. Sorry, I'm busy today. I have a. We are full. There's no more room in the cube. We are sorry. Look, we are late for work. Goodbye. Uh, the best part of this, and this is a, a a little gem in the memory alpha. Let's take what Seven has said as canon, right? That they I'm <laughs> passed on it. Uh, best of both worlds, Lacutus of Borg. Direct quote: The Borg only wish to raise the quality of life. For all species. <laughs> so that's how hard of an exclusion the Kazon are. Um, they're like the one exception to the rule. And I would say just 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 fully so. It's uh it might be my favorite part of this entire episode. It was definitely a joke at Voyager's own expense. Oh, it's worth pointing out this episode 
written by my man Brian Fuller. Yeah. Looks like it underwent some pretty heavy revisions, too. Like, it started off in a real crazy place, which I think still would have been a cool episode, but I understand why they ended up putting it in this uh, final. I think originally it was supposed to be Ensign Wildman goes through the the accident that's going to cause her to be brought back to life. She comes back as, like, zombie mom and wants to kill her kid and have her kid come back to zombie status, too, so they can, like, enjoy unlife together. Which, that sounds more like the, I mean, that would be rad as well bitching yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that would be really cool. very halloween appropriate yeah but that almost sounds like more it sounds like an easier story to tell like if you if you did the zombie mom angle right there's a clear out at the end if like uh okay we'll dispose of ensign wildman and now you know naomi will be like you know uh neelix's kid and he'll have to take care of her and all this and you know sure. the uncomfortable questions about death and all of that stuff and dealing with you know big real adult questions about the purpose of life uh, we don't actually have to confront because now it's just a, a, a spoopy halloween story right yeah so the fact that they decided to do this a with a major character and b not actually fix the problem which is very well, real fix is, the problem is better the, i i well no like i think that the rewrites helped this because it made it a better episode because it felt like more like some shit you could actually identify with um also being identified uh, we jump into the away team mission and it's uh chakotay and neelix and tom paris on a shuttle flying out to the nebula and that scene opens up with Tom Paris bitching to Neelix that he never makes pizza, which, again, seems like a really good slice of life into what it's like to be in Voyager's crew. And what I love about this argument about pizza is it's Neelix complaining about how difficult it is to make. And Tom's like, what do you mean? It's just some cheese, some sauce and some dough. And the fact that Neelix gets into like the intricacies and the difficulty of dealing with cheese. And we'll remember Neelix brought the crew and Voyager itself to its knees with his previous cheese exploits, I thought was fucking hilarious. Uh, the fact that the Neelix poisoning the ship with cheese moment was not mentioned was of immediate concern to Stevie. He's like, how could they possibly have written into this episode a line about Neelix making cheese and somehow not managed to for him to say Listen, making cheese is a dangerous process. I accidentally poisoned the ship once. Or Chakotay cutting in and saying, like, I don't think Neelix needs to get involved in any more cheese. I knew what they were hinting at. I got the wink wink. I got the nudge. I laughed. It was good. I, I just I just needed I just feel like the, I there needed to be that moment. I mean, if they're going to go ahead and say that the Kazon are too shitty to be assimilated, they can have one of those three characters have the the Jim Halper turn to camera when cheese gets mentioned for the rest of us. You you can do this, guys. I believe in you. Yeah, fair enough. So uh, they they finally reach the proto matter in the nebula. They have the space accident while in the death cart. And basically this green bowl of lightning hits Neelix right square in the chest. And uh, Tom, who, let us remember, is the second most qualified medical person in a Federation uniform. Somehow. <laughs> Somehow. Uh, goes over and he's dead. And then they finally do the credit roll. I Well, there's I, I want to talk about this. Chakotay second guessing Tom on like every medical thing he says you know use the cortical stimulators use this and it's like chakotay if you think you know so much more about medicine why isn't it you riding bitch in uh the in in kess's old nurse seat and then yet again to like really highlight how stupid it is for tom to be the most experienced medical sentient flesh bag on the ship chakotay goes because like the storm starts getting really bad that there and he's like Tom, I need your help to get out of here. And it's like, yeah, because Tom's a hot shot pilot. And here, nowhere else in Voyager ever has we have this this contradiction like so clearly defined. Like, does Tom the nurse continue to try to save the dying crewman? Or does Tom the expert helmsman go over and pilot the shuttle out of uh, extreme danger? If only there was another pair of medical hands on the ship. So 
they run through the treatment options. None of them work. Neelix is like for real dead. Like his brain's been fried. Everything's he's very dead. And they get back to the ship after uh, Voyager receives a distress call. And they say, like, Tuvok says, there's only two life forms aboard. Beam everyone to sick bay. And they go to sick bay and the doctor's like, yeah, he's dead. He's very dead. And I can start the postmortem, you know, anytime. And they start talking about how they're going to do a Talaxian funeral. Everyone's shocked. Everyone's just kind of just polaxed by the whole thing. You know, my my one complaint about this and really any other episode, because this is another situation where the Netflix capsule completely spoils what's going on. You know, Neelix is going to come back to life. And I feel like when someone dies before credits roll, you know, it's not going to stick around. And the actors never really try to do anything to convey you to a belief other than that. So they're all like a little somber, but it's like when Tom died back in, um, uh, threshold. Mm, yeah. People are like, Oh gosh, he's dead, but it's not the Tasha yard treatment. It's not, it, there's been convincing on screen deaths and on screen mourning. And this certainly was not one of them. I think that. You know, in the in the exact moment of, you know, there's that shock, right? This happened. What do we do? They never had really a, a long enough opportunity to, like, comprehend, oh, he's really dead, right? They had at most a few minutes for that to start to sink in before Seven of Nine comes in with the plot, essentially. I, I thought she said he was dead for, like, 18 hours. Yeah, but that was almost entirely with Tom and Chakotay. And like, oh, so it was that far of a trip for them to go on? Evidently, like for them to all like get back because, you know, they they beam down. The 18 hours. You're over here bitching about eight hours driving and they just had to drive 18 hours with a space cat. You know what? And Chakotay. <laughs> I don't know who to feel sorry for out of that whole group, honestly. <laughs> yeah, I, I you know what? I know exactly who I'm feeling bad for. And that is Tom Paris, because I don't know, man. I'm I'm sure Chakotay's tired of hearing fucking old prison stories. <laughs> that man runs on Tom. Ch- I don't want to <laughs> I don't want to hear about the time you had to barter for spam using your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Tom, I know. And then prison Jesus slit his throat like he was a fish. You tell that story every time we're in a shuttlecraft. Gosh, I, you know, I imagine Tom would take those opportunities to be like, hey, hey, Chicote, remember the time I shaved you, saved you from those non OSHA compliant stairs? You didn't have that. You didn't have your special Native American upchuck powers then, did you? Yeah. Yeah. So seven and nine just rolls in out of nowhere. And she's like, uh, yeah, so uh, I understand you're very proud of this holograms necromancy and that he has brought some people back from the dead dozens of times before but uh let me one up this fool and tell you that through the power of borg pixie dust we can bring him back to life even though he's been dead for 18 hours which everybody is like what and what's really funny to me through this entire sequence is how i don't want to say outraged but how incredulous the doctor is to the entire notion of bringing someone back from the dead when he himself has done it a dozen times previously. I will say that this would, I wish they had when they, of course we may, what we're making fun of primarily is a season one episode, the skull spider asteroid episode mm-hmm. where the doctor literally says that he does post-mortem revival protocols on one of the dead aliens to revive them. That's what he calls it. Um, there is no, discussion of exactly what that means what the parameters it's federation of that is. standard protocol yeah it's just federation standard protocol post-mortem revival procedures okay which the matter of fact way in which he does it in the matter of fact way in which that this matter is accomplished is laughable to the point where we have spent now years of our lives literally mocking that moment and, and they've done it a couple other times i mean they've brought people back well after the fact a few times there always seems to be this line of neural activity that 
they have to that, that there still has to be neural activity like they're not brain dead to be able to do it i think that's you know what they're saying is what's impossible here's like he's been dead 18 hours he has no neural activity nothing it's- more to the point they they go so far as to say he's starting to rot that there is necrosis going on at a cellular level and that he has like not only the damage he sustained from the injury, but just the body starting to decompose. So this is some real oh snap uh, moment. And, and, and I guess what, all I'm saying is that I'm not taking away from how stupid it, shit ass the Federation postmortem revival protocol line is. But this seems to be drawing a better picture of this going well beyond what you know federation medical science deems is possible and, and it, what it, a, it lays it a compelling case for it sure and what a position for janeway to be in where it's something that does not sound right bringing someone back to life who's been dead almost an entire day like what a weight on her shoulders and we've talked before about what is janeway's real motivation for having seven of nine uh on the crew at great risk to the crew and at detriment to their reputation in the Delta quadrant. Um, you know, we've talked about her doing it because she needs an outsider friend. She can let her guard down around. We've talked about it, that she's a pet project. That seven is Janeway's pet project to try and like establish a, a mother daughter relationship with. And we've also talked about potentially a hidden agenda where Janeway, the scientist is, conducting you know one of the the biggest deepest dives into uh the borg you know the chance to observe a drone in a in a captive remote location and now here's a chance to see fantastic borg technology accomplish a feat of medical marvel that even the the federation is uh in awe of. Would, would deem impossible you know like that this doesn't seem like this would be ne- at all po- within the bounds of possibility. And yeah, I mean, if it goes to our head cannon, it would certainly pay it off, right? Like suddenly, wow, this was worth doing. This was the correct call. And it's going to, you know, I th- obviously I already know the answer because it's Voyager. Does this sort of thing ever come back up again? I mean, to come back into the Alpha Quadrant and say, hey guys, here's our great voyage and all this other stuff and blah, blah, blah. And we got a way to... I don't know whatever crap we brought back, but also we can now resurrect people 18 hours after death. Pretty big feather to have in your cap. Yeah. BT tubs. This is something we can do now. I mean, the an- you know, the answer to that I know the answer to that. I don't think it takes away from everything else good about this episode, but it is. No, it is once again, just like what a missed opportunity. You know, to to like build on what you do here in the future. But oh, well. I want to build on something we've already done, too, which is very early on in Voyager. We started questioning what technological processes does Voyager employ or what dangers and hazards like the Beowulf getting demolecularized and, and added to the hollow matrix in the holodeck. What point do you lose your soul? <laughs> and I think it's safe to say 100 percent that following these events Neelix is back on the does not have a soul roster. I mean, it, I think that's the unironic point of the episode. Yeah. Like, what is the soul? What does mm-hmm. it mean to, you know, like what? of? And this is such an interesting thing sometimes because occasionally Trek goes down these holes, right? The spiritual hole. And most of the time they fail miserably. Hey, <laughs> I resemble that remark. I uh, I think most of the time they decide to give you an indication that that spiritual slash supernatural belief is true. Maybe not full explicit confirmation, but like when when Cass licked the Hellmouth, you're left with the impression of like some weird spoopy shit happened down there, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, this does exactly the opposite. It says no. None of that shit's real. And I think that makes it all the more, the payoffs that come all the more interesting as a consequence, because it leaves all those questions unanswered, but instead of unanswered of with the hint of maybe these things actually did happen, it's unanswered with a hint of that uncomfortable silence of, 
Ooh. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, you know? So obviously, uh, Janeway does ultimately decide that she is going to authorize this resurrection. Um, Seven kind of lays out on the line that what they're going to need to do is pull some of the pixie dust out of her veins. And what we mean, of course, is the Borg nanoprobes, which you have already warned me are going to become the silly putty of plot devices in the writer's room. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, And they're going to inject it and they're going to get some jumper cables out and try and Frankenstein them back to life Uh, that they're not sure how long it will last and how long it's going to take for him to recover and be able to start standing on his own to not require these uh, nanoparticle injections anymore. But they get the ball rolling. And yeah, they get uh, Neelix jolted back to life. And when he comes back to life and sits up, you finally see, because they've been hiding his face like the whole time, his face is all like heavily bruised and like corpsey looking. It's, it's a neat effect. Yeah, they do a really good job of making his makeup not quite right for the rest of the episode. Yeah. Uh, they, you know, they... They made him appear just kind of off. And I I didn't read the memory alpha. I didn't know if that was intentional or just uh, just that's how the lighting ended up working. But to me, it felt intentional that they were specifically portraying Neelix as somewhere between life and death. You know, sure. Uh, they fill Neelix in on the fact that he has been dead. He's like, oh, no, certainly I was just knocked out. Um he seems a little preoccupied, but by the time he leaves sick bay, it seems like he's back to his uh, chipper old self. But you can you can see exactly what direction this episode's going very early on. They have primed you by clearly presenting what Talaxian afterlife is supposed to be. And you see in his eye that something's not quite right and probably that he didn't you know experience afterlife and that other stuff. He ends up uh, going back to his quarters, I believe, uh, and going over to some sort of little religious tree shrine he has what was his sister's name uh yeah oh shit i forget god yeah, damn it's the name of, that they they named the thing in rise yeah oh all right i'm gonna have to look oh jeez this is awful we're terrible at having we're terrible show. how could we not good think this is, good thing this isn't star trek trivia i'd have to fucking go commit seppuku oh after. alexia alexia of course Alexia, uh, Alexia, where were you? And as he's walking into his quarters and kind of cast in a very dramatic light alone for the first time since this uh, this incident has happened, I'm like, man, I see the story they're going to tell and I think I'm down to hear it. But wouldn't this have been an awesome opportunity to have scanners in in space? You remember the old uh, horror movie scanners where they go and they start, you know, committing suicide to bring themselves back but nightmares and shit from hell starts following with them. yeah like shit yeah it starts following them i'll you know scanners the movie that is infamously the best head explosion in cinematic history uh yeah certainly i do remember it or i do know it and this had a sort of from beyond feel to it in a weird way like that you know, he's dealing with the consequences of death having come back with him a little bit, but it's entirely psychological and not supernatural, which I thought was was a good touch. Like instead of going that route, which provides an out, they didn't. Every time they have that opportunity, they didn't take it. And I think it was better for it. I, what I would have liked in this episode a little bit, <clears throat> if they were going to go a horror and gore route with it, uh, is to flesh out what sp- this species was that the Borg acquired this resurrection technology from. I think if it wasn't going to be a main character, they were doing this and they're going to go more for like a scary story vibe. Like, yeah, this resurrection thing works fine on the Borg drones and maybe the original species, but you get into like humans or other species and it's not that are not as resilient and you start getting some weird side effects that, that plague him through. But again, since this ends up being a spiritual episode, they don't really have to go that direction, but still, you know, seven and nine is always dropping like, Oh, we got this from this species and that from that species. Like, I want to hear more about those guys, but it's not the story they're telling, I guess. So the rest of the episode is essentially 
Neelix dealing with a very uncomfortable fact. And that is, while he was dead, he expected to experience his description of the uh, Talaxian afterlife, which is very like Elysian fields oriented. You know, it's a great forest and there's a big uh, guiding tree and you meet your family there. Um, You know, shades of the standard Christian afterlife with some of the more like pagany influences that those stories also have. And what actually happened is that nothing happened as far as he's aware. Mm -hmm. Uh, As he he later relates to Chakotay that he didn't see anything. He didn't experience anything. It was just nothing. And these beliefs that he had are very, were very sincerely held. And this, this really shakes him to a degree that is entirely paid off in Ethan Phillips being able to act his ass off. The Neelix we see is so clearly different than the one we're used to in terms of his demeanor, uh, his facial expressions, how he acts to people. Uh, but it's all done through him just doing it on screen, just being different. And I think the again, way to sum it up is like he's got a hesitation about him. A hesitation and a preoccupation. And when I consider how much makeup he has to wear on top of being able to pay this off kind of in a subtle acting note is all the more impressive to me, you know? The disappointment, especially when he starts confiding in Chakotay, uh, because they go on to the, the shuttle craft to, they go in the holodeck and they recreate the accident, which once again proves that you are always being recorded to the degree where they can just create holographic uh, simulations of any moment on Federation starships, which... <laughs> Big Brother is watching through infinite security cameras, but we except for see. when we need to know what's going on down in engineering at this moment, when he watches himself get gunned down, uh, and he crouches over and he says nothing. I expected to see all the stuff, and instead I saw nothing. And it creeps Chakotay out a little bit and includes him in that something's not right. And like I said, eventually uh, Neelix, I think it's uh, seven and nine goes in to have her one of her checkups with Neelix and Neelix flips out on her. His facade starts to really crack hard. And he says, you know, you didn't have a right to bring me back. Uh, I should have died out in that nebula and starts, I don't want to say suicidal, but he has a real crisis. And in the process, he stresses himself out. His body rejects the nanoprobes and he ends up back in uh, sick bay where they say, yeah, there was a variation. We've had to correct it. We're going to up his dosage. There's still a, uh, a question on how long he's gonna have to keep dealing with this board technology in him but uh neelix calls chakotay and really starts to confine heavy that he's got these doubts that uh he thought he was gonna see his family uh and like you said there's nothing and what made me sad was that they don't go to the obvious scientific answer as to why his family was not waiting for him in heaven which is of course because Neelix's family has never finished dying. Yes. They're still in the Talaxian moon, caught in perpetual hell as Jatral's super weapon ravages them. And because lazy ass Voyager didn't want to put more than five minutes into fixing a situation, they were like this close to solving everyone he's ever known, everyone he's ever loved is just being tormented half alive, half dead, somewhere up in the atmosphere. Man, I couldn't stop thinking about that moment. So, friends, if you've somehow only joined us in the middle of this rewatch, uh, please go back to our episode about Jatrell, which was back in season one. And uh, I believe our episode was titled Sorry, Not Sorry That I Blew Up Your World. (laughs) And we invented the Weak Shit Award on the basis of that episode alone. Because that episode has Voyager literally on the verge of being able to reconstitute and essentially resurrect every person that was killed on Talax's moon uh, by essentially space atom bombs. And after one half-assed attempt decides that was clearly almost working, decides to call it off because that's what the episode demanded to have a tragic ending. It was not well executed and it was not well written. And we saw that and we have made fun of that moment ever since. Now, 
I am willing because I know the story is trying wants you to to put that aside and say I'm going to act as if that was just something that was never possible to do. And if so, all of this pays off correctly. But as the hateful watchers of the show that we are, trust me when I say I thought like, uh, but yeah, she's just not actually dead, dude. <laughs> like she's yeah. just per- permanently atom scattered in essentially some kind of perpetual half life that could that could essentially be uh, fixed if Voyager had decided to spend an extra thirty minutes putting a, their fucking back into it. <laughs> hey, uh, Neelix, what's that, Chakotay? I got some bad news, buddy. Uh, well, the good news is your faith is legitimate. You know, the the bad news is your family is just going to be tortured for the rest of Eternia. So, uh, you know, win 50, some, lose 50. some, buddy. 50, 50, buddy. 50, 50. Could be worse, right? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> uh, the I guess like the the underlying point of the episode is Neelix trying to find a spiritual center and explaining this really disturbing experience that he had. And this is when he turns to Chakotay for that assistance. Because as we know, and as he reveals that he also knows, uh, Neelix has is, is heard that Chakotay has a has some space peyote, you know, <laughs> has some has some special juice that he could potentially make available for a little spiritual quest. And uh, Chakotay you know, says that he does and that he's willing to assist Neelix with with going on a vision quest. You know, I'm not playing the fake Indian bullshit right now sound because this may be the best use of his backstory we see in the show. You mentioned before the episode where Hess licks the Kel mouth, the- Kess licks the Hellmouth, and then Janeway has to go down to the surface and go through a religious trial, whatever thing, to sanctify herself to try to help Kess. In that episode, it framed uh, Chakotay as a spiritual doubter, but Tuvok as the the believer and the conf- not confidant, but the 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 advocate for what Janeway was doing. And in this one. I feel that they have correctly picked Chakotay to be the person to serve as kind of the the guide, the encourager. And, you know, like we talked about in the in our opening, this is the right application of Chakotay spiritualism. We've already put the time in. We we know that he's willing to offer his services to those who ask, as Balana has told Janeway that, you know, he tries to rope people in this stuff. Uh, and yeah, and he breaks out the old ha- uh, vibrating hand drugs, which, you know, it's the future. We can't have drugs. So they've had to replace space peyote with a pager. Yes. A, a or vi- like a vibrating uh, cup holder like you would have at Applebee's. It kind of looks like a cross between a Tiger Electronics hand <laughs> game, game from the early 1990s and a TI-85 calculator. Yeah. He's like, here, just chill out and play some drug wars. And before you know it, you'll have found your spirit animal. Oh, God, man. Everyone who gets that reference. I'm sorry. You're old like us. Anyway, uh, ultimately, Neelix does go on the spiritual journey and he brings like his medicine bag items, which are all personal effects. And uh, which I like what they did too. Yeah. It was all legit. It was all like real, like backstory items. There's like, a, there's a Kess reference. I know. Uh, yeah, like it was a, a flower from Kess's garden was one of his items. How shocking that we say the K word. And so they they fired this vision off, and it's really disturbing for Neelix because it's like the it, it's essentially all of these people from his life confirming his fears that he's going through so that there's no point to life but it's a fake out because it starts off like happy and i'm like oh okay so that's how they're gonna go right you think that oh this is where they're gonna turn the page right this is where they're gonna turn things around this is where you're gonna get the out right mm-hmm. it isn't it's this awful experience where he's confronting all of his deep you know uh psychological subconscious doubts anyway i guess i should say 
That is how I interpreted it. The show never tells you what this is. You, the viewer, are left to, to determine what it was that Neelix experienced. Chakotay brings up all of the potential interpretations of it later, but there is no actual interpretation. Is this some? Is this really like uh, some spiritually significant message that Neelix should just fucking kill himself? Is it actually him, you know, at war with his own subconscious over his doubts? Uh, that is never made clear, which I think is great. What is made because... clear and very clear is that Neelix's sister, Alexia, is fucking terrifying. She looks like if Chucky the murder doll was on crack. And him chasing her through the forest is like terrifying. And I think, again, it, <laughs> it it's a credit to, to Voyager for like, you can take something, make it seem like a harmless, funny space cat, but you put it in a little bit of like severe lighting. Talaxians are fucking scary, dude. Especially when they have eyes that are too small, yeah. which is what this lady has. That's the that's the thing that really gets you when you look at her is her eyes are too small. That is such an off putting feature. It's her little whenever you see her little fingernail teeth. It's like whenever you, you see someone that it's a trait in someone who's inbred <laughs> and it's it's always like just skeeves you out when you see it you know and the makeup that's I, I don't know if they did that on purpose or if it just was a happy accident but she looks just the worst and yeah you, you see her and you're like Ugh. my God. and then she like she just thanos snaps into ashes at one point to see her skull it's, yeah it's pretty fucked up what he what he goes through and uh he comes out of it and acts like there's no problems and immediately goes down the path of the stereotypical i have decided to end my life and i'm going to just r wrap up my business before i shove off kind of uh approach i like during the um his his spiritual journey where everybody's like yeah go kill yourself that what they keep repeating over and over again is you know what you have to do and that phrase you know what you have to do is such like established trek canon at this point for go be suicide remember back in the tng episode with uh drake from aliens when troy is going to throw herself in the warp nacelle Yo, yeah, it's one of the better Troy episodes, in my opinion, as far as like using her powers. Yeah, that's you know? the chant that he's telling her the whole time is, you know what you have to do. And I want to say there's another Voyager episode we just watched not too long ago where it's all, you know what you have to do. Um, It's it's a it's a acceptable. I want to say PG, but like, you know what I mean? Yeah, sort of. Yeah, yeah. It's it's an easy way to reference that without like going too explicit with the reference sure uh it also lets chakotay start getting a little aggressive with neelix too like when neelix skips his uh, first scheduled post spirit journey meeting with his new cult leader uh chakotay tracks him down in the mess hall and like you didn't come to our meeting and then he or he straight up orders him to the next one yeah he's he's trying to treat this you know with a level of seriousness that he certainly views it as which i get Balana and um, Catherine were not devout, but you will be my greatest disciple. <laughs> I I like that they he's you know, we, we've got to remember that technically he's a bit of a novice at all this stuff. Remember? Sure. Like as as was revealed to us, he's actually kind of like a Johnny come lately to the idea of of uh, being spiritual and, and really following his, his belief structure. And so he, and maybe he's kind of maybe like being stern about it. Cause he's got to like, make sure he doesn't accidentally screw someone yeah. up. Yeah. You know, he's trying to like, uh, you know, Neelix is going through a serious situation here. I gotta like be real hands on. Otherwise I might accidentally put him through something that caused him to commit suicide. Oh, wait, <laughs> Oops. Yeah, I hope you got practice insurance because uh, you're going to need it after this transporter accident. Um, yeah, so he's like, I order you to come to the next meeting. 
And Nick is like, yeah, sure. I promise I'll be there. Psych. I'm going to go write my suicide goodbye letters after having a weird scene with seven of nine. Like, it's interesting that he picks that to be his in-person goodbye. Um, I assume it's just because they wanted more seven time on screen. But, you know, they got to make sure they get that ass front and center. So not enough ass. I haven't brought it up in a while. But the, in case anybody at home was worried, the showrunners have not backed away from the profile shots or the boob center uh, scene framing that uh, we were introduced to Seven of Nine with. It's it's still alive and strong. Uh, he does have an interesting little bit to say to Tuvok in his going away letter, none of which, of course, mentions anything about Tuvix, uh, but Rise specifically is mentioned about how uh Neelix was able to finally earn Tuvok's respect, um, and that meant a lot to him. And then he decides to kill himself in what is going to be one of the most uh, spectacular and attention-grabbing ways possible. He's going to transport himself back out into the nebula, which was 18 hours away by shuttlecraft transport, you're telling me? Well... It looks like Voyager was outside the nebula at that point and had not mm. left it from the looks of it. So it could be that they were still trying to like figure out a way to get their hands on the proto matter. And that's why they weren't nearby. Fair enough. So I think we need to emphasize that not only does Neelix attempt to commit suicide, he successfully actually almost did. Uh, he is mid transport away. He has hit the button. He has made the decision to kill himself. And he is pulled back by a Johnny on the spot, Harry Kim, so that uh, uh, Chakotay can get down there and start to have the fateful monologue to talk about Let me, let me break it. the seriousness here for so, a second. Harry Kim says Neelix has overrode, found a way to override the transporter bridge lockout. What the fuck is Tuvok <laughs> doing over there? I mean, really. There has, okay, Seska running hot game, sure, I get it. Some of the other aliens and 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 problem causers and the fucking Maquis, sure. But now you've got Neelix, the cook, outsmarting your chief of security. We can look at this one of two ways, Joe. One, Neelix really got one up over Tuvok. Uh, I guess B. Uh, No, there there is no B. It's it's either Neelix is really that smart or Tuvok turned it all off and and handed him that suicide pill on a silver platter and just said space cat be gone. I understand why it is that it's necessary for them to have security. This is it's the mm. wharf problem, you know? It's it's the wharf problem writ large. You know, it's the old Star Trek axiom is that the Worf effect is that Worf is built up to be this badass who immediately always gets overwhelmed by whatever they're fighting because it has to be a threat. And then if it, Worf can defeat it, it's not a threat. And so it turns Worf into this meme that he's not really very good at his job. Same thing here. Tuvok is the security chief. As a consequence, he has to be the guy who fails for things to be a threat. If he was good at his job, nothing would ever happen, right? So th things have to still happen. So even Neelix is now capable of defeating security protocols, apparently, because that is what has to happen for there to be the moment. Because we have to explain why there isn't a way to stop this, right? We can't just have him go do it. There has to be something he overcomes because you people like you and I watch the show and be like, why isn't there a way to prevent someone from beaming out without authorization? OK, well, we know that that's a thing. So now we have to build up that to do this thing that we've written, that we want to have our payoff scene for episode to be that there has to be some security thing that he overcomes. So we'll just include that as a line of dialogue. That's how this keeps happening. But it's not just Voyager's issue. This is a Star Trek in general issue. And quite frankly, uh, Discovery, uh, it, it, it's even worse, in my opinion, because it overcorrects, because instead of having this kind of conundrum where someone has to you know be bad at their job essentially for there to be a story 
uh, they over explain with the most ridiculous techno babble possible, aka Klingon time crystals, uh, to do things. And I don't know. I think I prefer this simplified stuff to the overly complex pseudo science fuck yeah moments on Discovery. Sure. Uh, regardless, we're left with a situation where Neelix does successfully beam himself out into the nebula. Kim pulls him back in and is able to tie him up just long enough for Chakotay to get down there. Chakotay deactivates the transporter, but then Neelix reveals that he's got a backup plan, which is somehow a site to site transport using a tricorder that nobody can stop. Whatever. Uh, good dialogue is going to swoop into the rescue and make you not have to wonder about any of that stuff. Chakotay directly confronts him on the situation. You know, what did you see in this spirit journey you went on? You've been tight lipped about it. And Neelix finally starts spilling the beans on it. And Chakotay does a pretty good job laying out, you know, alternate solutions as to why people were saying these things maybe he was misinterpreting stuff that you know it's a lot of heavy material to come out and things might not be as they seem and maybe he's taking the stuff at face value incorrectly and it starts to give neelix some pause in what he's saying but then neelix starts to find resolve and wanting to kill himself because he has identified that his primary motivation as a person in the wake of watching his entire family die and i think they you know they could have said when i should have died with them which is the truth, had Neelix responded to the call to arms that he was issued during the war with Jatral's people, he would have been on the moon when Jatral's weapon went off and he would have died alongside... Well, I'm sorry. When I say died, I, of course, mean um, perpetual slow death in the atmosphere somewhere, but he should have been with them and that he has carried uh, the grief of their death with him this entire time. And it's only the reassurance that one day they'll all be together in heaven that keeps him going. And now that that's off the table he doesn't have a reason to live anymore. So that's the part of him that's missing is, is I, I guess hope, you know, the key conceit of most people's afterlife belief is this, this concept, the show calls it hope, but that sort of assurance that terrible things have happened in my life. I've lost loved ones. You know, I have gone through this suffering. However, I have this consolation that after my trials are completed and I move on from this plane of existence, I will be reunited with those people I've lost and I will be with them in an idyllic circumstance. And this is a very relatable belief. A lot of people hold those beliefs. And most people have, even in the most faithful, are going to have doubts about those beliefs. Absolutely. Uh, comfortable saying that I have a very religious family members who have have told have said that like that's a natural part of faith. And so for the show to go down this road for for Neelix to like say, like, I have used my belief in this this ultimate fate of everything being okay in the end as a way to be the person I am and to have take solace in these terrible things that I've witnessed. Like he literally says, I watched my world be destroyed. You know, I watched my family die and I was able to get through that because I knew that ultimately this would be what would happen. And that certainty was stripped from him. And now he does not know who he is or how to handle it. And he's having a psychological crisis. And so many people do in a moment of crisis, he's looking to do something rash to end his doubts and end his crisis. Uh, and unfortunately, it's the worst and most rash thing he could do, which is end his life. And... I I just I remember watching this for the first time. You're like, I don't know what I was expecting, but I was not expecting this. Like, this is heavy shit. And Chakotay, the way that he goes through, like, trying to explain to him that there are other ways to interpret everything that you've been through. And really, you know, you don't have to not lose faith over what you've, you've experienced it, it simply can grow and change into something else. You know, don't do this. 
I thought was a cool way to use him in a fashion that felt very appropriate and more in line with what I think they always wanted the character to be. Absolutely. And right before Chakotay can seal the deal, uh, psycho stalker girlfriend Wildman starts blowing up <laughs> homeboys, uh, you know, Motorola two way pager. And she's like uh, Wildman to Neelix. And I was like, oh, that's a good, you know, moment for her to chime in. And then there's a little bit more dialogue. And she's like, Neelix, why aren't you responding? And I'm like, whoa, crazy lady. And I thought that was going to be the end of her. And Chakotay's taking a couple steps more and trying to bridge that emotional gap with Neelix. And he and Neelix have had some very interesting relationships in the past, mostly with Chakotay telling Neelix to do something and Neelix disobeying, wandering off and losing body organs in the process. And then the doors open up. And this is like 25 seconds after the last time Wildman's contacted Neelix. And she walks and she's like, Neelix, you didn't respond. So I asked the computer where you are and I've come to hunt you down. <laughs> and Neelix is just like, yeah, Jeez, I'm trying to like on. figure some stuff out. <laughs> like, now's not a good time to be crazy obsessive stalker with me. And they lay the, you know, there's monsters in the closet. We need you to come in. And it, it finally lets Neelix make that choice. Do I, you know, dwell in the past or do I realize the fact that I've got a new family in front of me? I've got a new role. It's not just about me and what I've lost. It's about what other people lose if I choose to to put myself out there. And um, in the end, he decides to move forward in life and and be grateful for what he has and embraces new family and uh it ends up being a very touching and a very insightful look into several characters on the ship it's a lot of old bumbling turning into a big payoff i think uh especially out of chakotay's spiritual corner and uh i think the whole thing feels really good and really well done uh you could have gone some very creepy angles with borg resurrections and and zombies and all that stuff but uh this i think was was the better option it's been a long time since we have a good neelix episode and this is certainly the right way to open that door back up yeah i think that it's a mature uh realistic and uh resonant in a way that star trek rarely is to like your real life and things that you may have seen or experienced in yourself and others and uh, that always makes storytelling more relevant when it can do that. And I think that Ethan Phillips acting chops in this were on full display. Uh, he went the gamut of emotions, you know, from screaming right in seven of nine's face, like yeah. almost violent to psychological break to, you know, desperation to, you know, quietly trying to, you know, confront these, these demons in himself. And, and, uh, you know, it, it sold everything that happened. And, you know, I, I would call it, uh, one of my personal favorite episodes of Star Trek. Um, I understand it's not going to be most people's favorites, but, and mine across all Trek. It's, that's a good it's one, one for sure, favorite. man. I really like, again, just, just the, the slice of life angle and all the Neelix Chakotay spiritualism. Uh, normally I can't stand these types of episodes. The, the last one where space spider skull asteroid, asteroid. Uh, I hated <laughs> you liked uh, this one. I think we can both agree was, was a really great one. Uh, moving forward from here. Season four, episode 13, we got Harry Kim just, smiling a big smile content with the fact that he was supposed to die last season and somehow he's still alive doing absolutely nothing with his life voyager crew is assaulted in the form of nightmares sounds familiar uh, an alien species functioning only in a dream world traps the crew in a shared dream um we already had this episode it was called the thaw and it was fucking awesome <laughs> <laughs> i don't i think there might be less jungle tech involved this well time, count me but, out then you know, uh, this is this is the season four, I think, is picking up from this point forward. So I think we're through the worst of it. My friend. this looks like some real space hell madness Cthulhu stuff we're about to go into here, as if bringing dead space cats. Yeah, really space. Uh, it's just a space cat pet cemetery. That's that's what this was. Well, kind of it was you know. space cat pet cemetery. I like mm -hmm. it. That's why you got to incinerate your dead cats. 
Uh, yeah, we'll see how that one goes. I do you remember anything about this episode? Waking moments? I don't actually. I don't at all. I remembered this one and the one after the one, the one after this one, quite well. So this episode I remember quite well. Next one's blank. The one after that I remember quite well. So I look forward to watching it again with fresh yeah, eyes. Well, here's to hoping. Hey, speaking of burning dead cats, thanks for listening to Beach Police, the hateful voyage through the Delta Quadrant. Uh, you can find us on Twitter, on Facebook. You can email us at BeecherPlease at gmail.com. And uh, feel free to share the show, like, subscribe on all the, the ways that you can listen to us, whether it be uh, iTunes or Spotify or uh, Google Play, or literally anywhere, find yeah, podcasts. Just download it, and then we had a really great subject or suggestion from uh, the audience: is just force people in your wedding party to have to listen to this on your way to your wedding. I mean, it's yeah, legit. I mean, if you're getting married, no one's going to tell you no. Yeah. Trust me. Yeah. Like that's the one day you can get away with whatever shit you want to get away with. So use it to spread Vijer, please. A hateful voyage to the Delta Quadrant. You know, we'll thank you. But that's it, though. That we're just going to thank you. All right. See ya.